Good morning, everyone. This is Jennifer Lasanti, the Director of Sales at Burem Purvis. And first, I want to thank you very much to take time out of your busy schedule. We know fourth quarter has hit. This is the busiest quoting month of the year. Um, this is the third time we've offered this webinar, but every time we've offered it, we've actually had new options to uh, present, and we're excited that there is a brand new option to bring to the table. Uh, this time around. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Other than if you do have questions, please type them in into the chat box throughout the presentation. Uh, Stacy Reader will be monitoring them. And if there's a lot of questions on a topic I'm addressing at the time, she might stop me and we'll address those questions at that time. But we'll certainly address all questions at the end. And like always, we will be sending out a copy of this presentation after the webinar. All right, so quickly we'll go over the agenda. This just gives you a feel for what we'll be talking about today. We are going to start the webinar by reviewing kind of a, a quick summary of what these traditional large group, the 51 plus groups, have been experiencing or what they will experience actually as they transition to 1 to 100 small group in California. And then we'll get into our composite options, et cetera, and some resources that Beer and Purvis has to help make sure that this fourth quarter goes as smooth as possible, especially with the 51-100 transition for you. So a quick summary is that everyone needs to realize that the definition of small group in California has changed, and it changed in January of this year. So you'll see to the left there that the old definition was determined by AB 1672, and our small group in California was defined as 2 to 50, but it was based on eligible employees. So if you had a lot of part-timers or seasonal, et cetera, but you only had 40 eligible employees, you were small group and vice versa. That definition was based on either the previous calendar quarter or year. The group could decide what they wanted. So if they were, say, 45 last year, but they recently hired a lot of eligible employees and now they're 65, they could actually, in the prior to this year, go to large group. Um, small group does require documentation to prove number of eligibles, as always, and that's always proven by a DE9C, which if you're not familiar with small group, that's the California Quarterly Wage Report that the groups submit with the state of California every quarter, documenting who their employees are and wages being withheld, et cetera. If you have, for example, a new hire that hasn't been working for the company long enough to be on the DE9C, then they must provide payroll. The new definition, however, starting in January, is now 1 to 100. And I believe California is only one of four states in the U.S. that have small group defined as 1 to 100. We do get lots of questions on if we think that will change. The state of California, in particular, because the, the exchange is so dominant here, um, likes small group being to 1 to 100. So there's no political movement at the moment to change that back to 1 to 50, like the most of the rest of the nation. So we are 1 to 100. So not only the size has changed, but the definition of the group size has changed, meaning that we no longer look at eligible employees. So this is important for everyone to realize that we go by the pay or play definition to determine group size, which means we're actually looking at full-time equivalents now in 2016. The law states that you can determine your group size just like we've been able to do in the past, either the quarter or year, whatever the group wants to do. And then the DE9C and payroll, or like always, have, are going to prove the group size. However, all the carriers for the most part have come out with these attestation forms because really for a carrier to verify that the group has a certain number of equivalents, you would actually need payroll for the previous year and to document all that. No carrier wants to go through that. So they've all, for the most part, created these attestation forms that the group signs to determine, you know, are you over 100 or under 100? So at the bottom of the slide, there's a quick summary of how our beer and purpose carriers are handling this definition of small group. And you'll see that for the most part, everyone is the same. Um, everyone will let you determine your group 1 to 100 full-time equivalents for the previous year. There is one outlier currently on the second item there when you look at quarter. Anthem is currently stating, no, you can't go by the group size in the past quarter, so that group has grown recently. They're still going to say, no, group size currently is determined by equivalents in the previous calendar year. 
Then the last item here is proof of group size, and this has been a nice surprise with ACA that all of our carriers, for the most part, have gotten more lenient as regarding proving group size in the new world. So you'll see that based on the group size, most of our carriers will be more lenient. So if you just start with Aetna there. For little groups under five, they're still going to want the D9C or payroll. But for groups of six or more, they just have a form that the employer signs stating, no, we're a group of 1 to 100, et cetera. Anthem, the same. They start at six lives. They'll take the prior carrier bill currently instead of a D9C. They are not um, very specific on when payroll might be required. Just be aware, if there's a big variance on the number of employees on that bill you submit to the number of employees enrolling with Anthem, Anthem may come back and ask for payroll to document that these people do work for the company and that they're meeting participation, which is the number one thing the carriers really care about. So be aware of that. Um, you know, if you submit a bill with 30 people and you're enrolling five with Anthem, they're probably going to come back and say, no, show us your D9C or payroll proving the group size and participation. CalChoice is our only carrier that still always, no matter what the group size is, still requires a D9C and or payroll for those new hires or new groups. HealthNet has brought back their special from last fall. However, they did change it a little bit for 2016. They, too, start at 10 lives, like United, which we're about to talk about. So if you have a group of 10 or more, they, too, will take a prior carrier bill like Anthem instead of the D9C. But they do outline it very specifically that if you have plus or minus 10% variance from that bill to the enrollment, that they will then come back and ask for payroll to document the changes. And United Healthcare is very simple like Aetna. They don't require a bill, a D9C for a group of 10 or more. They just have a form like Aetna does that the group signs to attest that they're 1 to 100 with 10 eligible, not enrolling. And then all the documents or master apps, of course, do ask for detailed information. So all the information always does need to be consistent on the master application as well as these attestation forms. So this slide just quickly explains that in California, the new definition of small group is defined by SB 125, and you'll see in bold there at the bottom that it matches identical the pair play definition. So if you've gone through and for 2015 you calculated the group was 50 lives for pair play, then they're going to be 1 to 100 small group in 2016 or vice versa, if you calculated their 125 full-time equivalents, then in 2016 you're going to write them in large group, 100 plus. A quick reminder of how you count those employees, because again, it's not eligibles. For um, the pay or play definition, you have to get a lot of data, and hopefully they've been tracking this for the past couple of years, but not all groups have been, so you might need to assist them with that that you count all the full-time employees, the number of bodies, and remember that you do include seasonal workers. We're so used to discounting seasonal workers and saying, oh, they're not eligible, not even acknowledging them. But for the pay or play definition and the new small group definition in California, you actually include them in your account. And you're counting those bodies on a monthly basis for the previous year. Then you have to add up all the non-full-time employees, including the seasonal workers again. However, when you're looking at the non-full-time employees, the equivalents, I'm sorry, not, I shouldn't say non-full-time employees. They're just, um, they could be full-time employees, but they might not consistently be working full-time. You're adding up their number of hours worked, not how many employees are in that situation. So again, full-time employees, you add up the number of bodies. Full-time equivalents, you add up the number of hours that those folks have worked. This might give you a better example. We have a spreadsheet where on the far left, you're going to add those number of bodies for the full time consistently working 30 hours a week. There's no question. The other employees that might work 35 hours this week, 25 hours next week, you're not sure. They're not consistently 30 hours plus um, week in and week out. You add up those bodies. Now there is a maximum of 120 hours per month that you give an employee credit for. Then you're going to divide that, or you add up the bodies plus the number of hours worked to make those equivalents to determine on a monthly basis how large the group was. At the end of the year, you'll actually divide by 12 and see what the average is. So here's a better example. So here in our example, we have 91 full-time employees. Every week we know they're going to show up and work 30 hours or more a week. No questions. 
However, we have all these other employees that total 1,000 hours, which gets us to 8.33 of full-time equivalents. We add that to the 91 bodies, and then we average through the year, and luckily uh, we're still small group by one body. So I've mentioned that by law in California, it does state that you can look at calendar quarter or calendar year. And you know that matters a lot when a group has either, typically you're trying to get them into a large group is what most people think that they want for a group because they get those composite rates. So if a group has grown, so if an example, we have a group that in the past quarter they have 105 full-time equivalents, but all of last year they averaged 87. So you could write this group in large group based on the quarter. However, some things to um, consider before choosing what scenario that you're going to put them in is remember most carriers, which we'll address at the end of this webinar, have been reaching out to the groups and brokers with these attestation forms asking four to six months prior to the group's renewal, how large are you? There's no documentation required. They just, you sign the form, yes, we're 101 full-time equivalents, you would be moved to a large group platform. Large group carriers are not requiring proof of this. They do want a census, and they're just going off the, the census that you submit for an RFP. The groups with 101 few full-time eligible are groups that you might want to consider. Everyone has in their mind, which you know makes sense, that we want to get composite rates. It's just so much easier on the administrative side. So I want to squeeze this group into 101 full-time equivalents, if at all possible. However, there are groups that will be over 101, but benefit eligible, which is what the rates are going to be based on by that large group carrier, could be pretty minimal. So you could have a group of literally 150 full-time equivalents, but they only have 40 medical eligible. 40 lives is not the most attractive group, especially depending on the health of that group and the SIC code that that large group carrier you know, is evaluating when they're giving you rates. They have to give you rates nowadays in the ACA world. They'll decline initially for non-competitive. If you push them, they'll give it to you, but those rates might not be sellable for that group. So once you receive the large group quote, the small group carriers within that same carrier are saying, hey, if you said you're 101 full-time equivalents and then you get those large group rates or you don't like them, you want to stay in small group with us, that is not allowed is what all the carriers are staying at this point. You would probably might be able to move to a different carrier, but again, they couldn't stay with the same carrier. If they've already attested to being large group, they get the rates. You can't then pick and choose between the large group and small group rates within that same carrier. Quick reminder on plan changes. So when a group is moving from the historical large group market down to small group 1 to 100, small group is bound to have all those essential health benefits, uh, very similar to what the group probably already gives their employees now. The only big difference will probably be that pediatric dental and vision services uh, that has to be included on small group benefits. Um, for the most part in California, all of our groups already have the, the remainder of these benefits. What is a little unique in the small group market is that there's limits on out-of-pocket maximums. So the irony of that is that even though ACA is supposed to give everyone richer benefits, the out-of-pocket maximums increased, as we saw with ACA, but the difference is that all costs, including deductible as usual, but now Rx, coinsurance like usual, et cetera, accrue to the out-of-pocket maximum. So you get to the out-of-pocket maximum faster. So that's why, if you look at the small group portfolio, some of those out-of-pocket maximums are actually higher than they used to be prior to ACA. And then this is actually what is unique in the small group world, is these metallic plans. So in small group, the carrier has to design plan designs that fit into one of four buckets, platinum, gold, silver, bronze. And there's actuarial values equated to each of those metallic tiers. So for example, a platinum plan has to fit within 92% to 88% actuarial value. They the carriers, if they wanted to create a richer plan design that equated to, say, 95% actuarial value, wouldn't be allowed to offer that plan in the small group market. And we had that question yesterday, um, you know, why are the large group plans richer than the small group plans? Because we used to have some rich plans in small group, and we still do, but a large group might have plans that exceed that 92% actuarial value, where small group, they just, the carriers can't allow or offer those plans anymore. And as a result, the Plan creativity has kind of disappeared in small group. When you're bound to four different buckets to fit plans in, uh, what we've seen is the carriers 
a lot of them have reduced the number of plan designs they offer because you don't need so many plans within such a small band. Now, network changes, when we first held this webinar a couple months ago, uh, we were talking about, remember, the small group networks are not always the same as the large group networks. And in particular, that was, we started talking about Anthem and HealthNet. HealthNet, however, has rolled out their full network HMO and small group in 2016, so that doesn't matter. HealthNet's HMO network and small group and large group are the same. And now we're very excited that Anthem has also, as of July 2016, they've enhanced their full network HMO in small group. So historically, Sutter, for example, like Palo Alto Medical Foundation, wasn't in Anthem's small group full network HMO, but now it is as of July. They've always had it on the PPO side, it was just the HMO side that was missing, but that's been fixed. So one thing when you move groups from the historical large group market to small group is something to get used to is in small group we sell a lot of PPO. The PPO premiums sometimes are more competitive than HMO. So in large group when you have an HMO and PPO offered, we still see 60%, 40% split between PPO and HMO membership. In the small group market, however, because PPO premiums are so much more attractive sometimes in HMO, that we actually see a lot more membership on PPOs in small group than historical large group. And so this is just a sample of a quote that we looked at. Uh, the group's current mid-market HMO premium was 569. When they moved to small group HMO, it was going to increase quite a bit to 658. However, a PPO premium for a very similar benefit is 560. So of course, moving from an HMO to PPO requires some education to the employee on the differences, uh, but you've got a lot more freedom and flexibility, but there might be more out-of-pocket costs on the PPO. But if you don't use the benefits a lot, you're going to save money big picture because the monthly premium is lower. Underwriting. If you have always worked in large group and now you have, you know, your 75 life group is going to be considered a small group, um, one benefit of small group underwriting, believe it or not, is it's much quicker. Uh, with most of our carriers, we get approvals, group numbers, once we have all the documentation, in two or three days. Large group, historically, that's taken more two to three weeks. So it is faster. However, if you're not used to the small group world, um, it is more tedious. But another benefit of small group underwriting, especially in the ACA world, is we found that the small group carriers are more lenient alongside Kaiser. So looking at Aetna there to the far left, their rule alongside Kaiser is they want 40% of the group, minimum of five enrolled to enroll with Aetna. Anthem depends on the number enrolled, but if you're a five life group or more, they just want 30%. 70% can go with Kaiser. CalChoice, of course, is the one cure that doesn't have a rule of how many people can take Kaiser. You can have all but one in the CalChoice group take Kaiser. HealthNet still on the high side a little bit. Group of six or more eligible, it's 50%. Needs to enroll with HealthNet. The best carrier we have right now, and they've been doing this since 2014, and we know it's continuing into 2017, is United Healthcare. If you read it, you'll see there's a 60% listed there, but they count the Kaiser and the UHC bodies towards the 60%. They also view individual waivers as valid waivers. So you could have a group of 100 employees, five take UHC, 95 take Kaiser, and that would fly with UHC's underwriting role. So we've been writing a lot of UHC alongside Kaiser. As I alluded to on the last slide, small group underwriting is more tedious, so they do require all apps and declinations from all eligibles to be submitted prior to the approval, especially in the fourth quarter when we have people taking vacation for the holidays. Um, you know, we get lots of questions of that person's on vacation. Can we submit that after approval? Small group does require to have all applications and declinations prior to the, approving that group. And then we mentioned earlier that uh, in small group, the carriers typically want the D9C and four to document that all the employees work at the company. Owners never have to be on the D9C, but they do have to provide legal documents proving that they own the company and therefore they're eligible. And then for new hires that wouldn't be on the D9C because that's a quarterly doc, um, they have to provide payroll to prove that they are a new hire for that company. Now, if you can see the, the footnote at the bottom, however, is what we indicated that a lot of our carriers, Aetna, Anthem, HealthNet, and United Healthcare, so pretty much everyone but CalChoice, uh, will take the either the attestation form that they've created 
or the prior carrier bill for their larger small groups versus having to submit these D9Cs, legal docs, payroll, etc. One hot topic, and this, this topic is picking up again right now, is we're getting lots of questions on the annual special open window that the carriers have to allow once a year in small group 1 to 100. So this is a time where the insurers have to take groups that apply if they are submitted within a special window. That special window is you see on the third bullet point from November 15th through December 15th for a January 1st effective date. And believe me, the carriers are extremely strict on that deadline. So uh, you can't call us and say, oh, you know, can I submit it on December 16th? We had carriers that were actually um, clamping down on the deadline down to wait, you know, a minute. If it was a minute late, they were not accepting it because the groups don't want these special open window groups. And the reason why is because the carriers cannot decline a group based on participation and or contribution. You know, carriers never know really what the contribution is that the group's actually paying, but they always know participation. And so if they're not getting enough participation, you know, it's, it's a big risk for the insurance company. But this is one time where if you submit for that January 1st in that one month, then they can't decline you. Be aware that you must meet all other rules, so you would still have to qualify as a 1 to 100 full-time equivalent group, and you do have to get waivers for all those people. So you could have a group of 100 people, only one person is enrolling, but you'd have to provide 99 waivers for the 99 eligible employees, if they're eligible. And the last bullet point, one of this is new, one is remaining from the past two years, is that both Aetna, which is new, and Anthem has been doing this for the past couple of years, state that they will not allow the special open window alongside Kaiser at all. So if those two carriers know you're offering Kaiser and you're submitting for the special open window, they're going to say they don't qualify, they have to be a standalone carrier. However, HealthNet, CalChoice, and United Healthcare will let you sell alongside Kaiser. And again, you could have one person going non-Kaiser and the rest of the group going Kaiser, and they would have to take that group if you submitted it in the timely fashion, qualify for small group, and gave all the documentation required. Rate changes. So the biggest change and why people are trying to avoid small group, if at all possible, is the lovely community rating that started with ACA World. So one thing that is consistent amongst all carriers is there's 19 rating regions in the state of California. That's one more than the other states. Um, but it, it's all the same. So if you're looking at you know, Santa Clara County, I believe that's region seven, but it's region seven for all carriers. You don't have to memorize the different carriers' regions anymore. The other item on the rate factors is that, and this is the biggest change, is that we need ages for every family member you're going to enroll with that group. And the reason is, is because everyone gets a rate now, premium. So there is a different rating factor for each age bracket. Now, 0 to 20, those kids, there is just one rate premium per kid in the 0 to 20. However, um, from 21 to 63, there is actually a different rate every year then there's no longer a Medicare primary or secondary premium. There's just one rate, so um, that's a big change as well. Now, the number of family members. It is important to know that if you have a lot of kids under the age of 20, you're only charged for the first three, the, the oldest three. However, when that oldest child becomes 21, and say you did have four kids in the family, you would now be charged for a 21-year-old in addition to three more dependents under 20. And that has been one of the bigger factors that's affecting these renewals for these groups when they move from mid-market to small group, is if it's a group that has a lot of dependents that are, say, college age that are still on the plan, all of a sudden it gets very expensive um, for that employee because it looks like they have multiple adults on the plan. And there's no cap for how many kids you can have between 21 to through 25. And then the employer zip code, that is nice because now all the carriers are finally uh, charging based on where the employer is, not where the employees are. And so you just need to know where the group is located. We do recommend that when you give us censuses to quote, that you do ask for the employee residence zip code because we always want to make sure that the plan the employer wants to offer is available for all their employees because everyone commutes from very far away now. So we will be checking that on your behalf. 
And the last thing I want to say about these uh, community rates is the fact that everyone is consistent that you're charged one premium for the whole contract year. So if I turn from 39 to 40 within the contract year, my premium doesn't go up mid-year anymore like it used to in small group, but at renewal, my premium will change from the 39-year-old to the 40-year-old. Everyone's caught up at the renewal date. So as I alluded to earlier, the biggest increases that are going to hit groups when they move to small group are those groups that were actually healthy in the large group world because we can't give discounts for healthy group in the 1 to 100 market anymore, and groups that might have been getting an SIC code discount in the large group. When they go to small group, SIC code doesn't matter, so they're lumped in with all the other groups. All those car dealerships and law firms that the large group carriers don't want, um, they're lumped in, in all together in the small group world. And I mentioned that groups that have a lot of employees with dependents age 20 or more will see a bigger hit when they move from large group to small group. Uh, what is different from what we experienced back in 2014 with our small groups going to the ACA world is that these large groups moving to small group, those young employees in the group, typically what we're seeing is they're actually getting a rate decrease. When the traditional small groups moved to ACA world a couple years ago, they were actually, the young people were getting a hit in the premium. But since the large group composite rates, those young employees have been subsidizing older employees on those composite rates for years, that 30-year-old premium in the large group composite might actually uh, be higher than what that 30-year-old will be charged in the small group community rate. So again, it's very unique to the group and the demographic as far as, you know, the rate's going to be higher in small group or lower in small group. And that's why we want to suggest that you look at everything. So now we're going to move on to the rest of the presentation that is going to look at options for these groups that are historically large group that are moving to 1 to 100 equivalents and how you could look at retaining composite rates for these groups. So the three options we have to propose today are Trinet, the PEO, UHC, ACEC, HealthNet, this is a new portfolio that was just announced a couple weeks ago, HealthNet large group has created a brand new product for groups that are are truly 101 full-time equivalents, but they have very few medical eligible between 51 and 100. They're creating a special um, product for that, which we're going to discuss today, and this is the, the brand new one. So with rate changes, you'll see that, you know, example A on the left, we just took a group, you know, the employee's 42, the spouse is 41, then they've got uh, a lot of kids, but they're only charged for the first three in the community rate. Their premium for a month as a family is 1819 When they go to composite rates, we all know how that works, there's one rate for a family, and that is actually higher. It's the 1941. So the composite rates were higher for this group than the group when they moved to small group community rates. However, in example B, you'll see the community rates are pretty high because you no longer get two kids for free that 22nd, I'm sorry, the 22-year-old and the 24-year-old are charged a premium and therefore it really has a big impact on the community rates for this family. So they are now charged $2,622. So the composite rates for that group are lower. So we need to look at these historical large groups, the demographics of the group. Some groups will like community rates and some, some groups won't. So the groups that won't, they have these three options. So again, it's Trinet. UHC's ACEC, it's specific to engineers, but it's a, been a very hot product all of a sudden. And then Health Net's new product for these 51100 benefit eligible. So starting with Trinet, Trinet is a broker-friendly PEO. The benefit is, of course, composite rates down to one life group. We, you know, it depends on the groups, but you have it, what we've seen is they're very competitive against other medical and small groups. But you do under, need to understand that there's an admin fee that is charged per employee per month on Trinet. We have looked at groups where the medical premium plus the admin fee still makes a lot of sense, but it's something you need to acknowledge and take into consideration with the group when they're deciding. Trinet has had a very strong pool. In the past 10 years, it's been a single-digit renewal. What you get with Trinet is just not composite medical premiums, but you also get um, payroll, online enrollment, HR assistance, compliance assistance, et cetera. And then Trinet's always been doing this, but now it's by law, that when you move from your normal 
you know, individual setup to China, the PEO, there's no tax restarts on payroll, which is a nice feature. The plan designs within Trinet, it's large group plans, so they could be richer than the small group plans that are offered in the small group world. They do give medical deductible credit when you move over from, you know, outside of Trinet into Trinet Medical. And there are different portfolios. So they have a white color portfolio called Passport and a blue color portfolio called SOI. Commissions, of course, is something you need to take into consideration. With Trinet, you are paid on the Blue Shield medical premium. It is higher than if you sell Blue Shield Direct. It's currently 6.5% commission to the broker. In addition to that, you get 15% of the admin fee through, for the PEO. That averages about $120 a month, and so you would get on top of the 6.5% commission for the medical premium, you'd also get $18 per employee per month for commission. And then there's a setup fee when you initially move the group over to Trinet, that averages about $3,000. You can get 25% of that, so that's an ad additional $750 the first year you move it over. So we've looked and we have an example later in a couple slides that shows you you could uh, make more money even though you're just being paid on the Blue Shield premium. However, if the group is higher Kaiser penetration, you're not getting paid on the Kaiser premium. So that wouldn't be something that you want to propose to Trinet just because you probably would not make as much as if you keep it on the outside market. One benefit of Trinet in addition to the actual product the client gets is for you as a broker, they only allow one quote, kind of like on the worker's comp side. So if you bring us a quote request for Trinet, it blocks the market for all other brokers. You're, they only release one quote to the group, so that would be you and no other broker could bring it to the table. You've already blocked the market. And then you are a broker of record on that group forever. No one can take B of R on that away from you. Here is the example I was alluding to. So if you look to the left, it has Anthem Blue Shield Health Net United. We looked at comparable small group medical premiums compared to Trinet's Blue Shield medical plan. And at the top, you'll see just the monthly cost for this 21 life group. So anywhere from 14.3 for Anthem to you know 15.4 for Shield, 15.6 for HealthNet, or very low United 13.8. Trinet's Blue Shield premium within, I'm sorry, within Trinet is 12.8. So it's actually lower than all the community rates options that we have in the small group market. Don't forget, you do have to add that admin fee for those 21 employees, but even then, when you add the admin fee plus a premium, it's still right in range with the small group community rates other than United Healthcare. Now, for you guys, the commission levels, if you look to the left, the small group world, you see the current uh, small group commission typically is 5%, United 6.5%, so you see the commission that you're getting uh, down in bold at the bottom, anywhere from 8,500 to 10,007 with United. What you'd get with Trinet, because they're paying you off the 6.5% of the Blue Shield membership only, and the setup fee, and the monthly admin fee, you'd actually make $16,000 a commission, you know, almost double for what you'd get with Anthem, that same group. So Trinet is not perfect for every group. So the groups that are um, make a lot of sense for Trinet are groups that are growing quickly. You know, all that onboarding, all that people work, et cetera. Let Trinet do that for the group, and the group can just focus on actually making their product. Groups that have more than 51% out of California, is another great group for Trinet. They'll take care of that. The other option outside of Trinet that we have is United Healthcare, but none of our other carriers would even consider that group. And then groups that, you know, need a lot of hand-holding as far as HR, HCA compliance, those groups are perfect for Trinet. Let Trinet handle all that for the group, takes off your plate, takes off the group side, um, and everyone's happy. And I already discussed that they've got the two products, the Passport for white color and the SOI for gray or blue color. So the benefits and value of Trinet are, one, it's broker-friendly. You know, if your group has talked to you before about a PEO and they've probably talked to ADP or Paychex, if they want to go to ADP or Paychex, you're out. You can no longer be their broker, but you could still propose Trinet and be part of that mix. The base PEO concept is that they consolidate and they run the business aspects for the group. So they consolidate all the HR, the payroll, benefits and compliance. 
So you know a lot of people that are very good at, at what they do, but they're not very good at running the business side of, the, of owning the company. That, again, is a perfect example. Put that group with Trinet. Trinet helps run the actual business, deal with the employees, et cetera, and the group itself can just focus on the product that they produce or the service they produce for their customers. Also with Trinet, it does really um, improve efficiency because it reduces eligibility and billing errors, errors, which we see all the time with these small employers that you know, aren't very good at, they don't have a full-time HR person, um, so things happen. With Trinet, they would, Trinet would take care of those issues. Then also they do get to have large group style plans and uh, that helps them attract and retain talent, especially you know, in the Bay Area or San Diego, wherever these groups are, that they're competing against these larger high-tech or biotech firms. They also do the ACA compliance, which is a lot of time taken away from the group and you. And they have a, a nice technology platform, which of course has been the, the big buzz the past couple of years about online enrollment. That's all built into Trinet. You don't pay anything extra for that. It's just an admin fee. So Trinet is like quoting large group, and it's probably more difficult because you're quoting multiple lines of coverage. So it's quoting workers' comp, it's quoting, I'm sorry, quoting uh, health premiums, quoting payroll, et cetera. So we do need a lot of data to quote a Trinet group, and it won't take us 10 minutes like a small group quote. It would take us probably five to seven days to produce that quote once the data is complete. So for workers' comp, we do need to have the deck page, payroll report showing the gross wages, and five years of lost runs for the workers' comp. Health, you guys are, I'm sorry, health, you're very familiar with what we need. We need the bill, we need the plan summaries, the census, everything you're used to. As far as rates, again, now we're moving on to the UHCs. This is UHC's engineering trust. It's called ACEC. Uh, we've had this product for years. Um, the volume of business that we've started selling with this product has drastically increased in just the past month. So um, I know we've talked about this before, but definitely take a look for the groups that qualify, which again are engineering firms and not software engineers. They're you know consultant engineers. So the beauty of ACEC through UHC is that you get composite rates down to two life group. The rates are actually based out of Illinois, so they're more competitive than the California premiums that you're going to get when you go to other markets. It's been running very well. United Healthcare's had this trust since 2007, and the persistency has been 93% year in, year out. And they have a very strong history of single-digit renewals for this pool. As far as plan designs, just like Trinet, there are large group plan designs, so you know these don't have to be this metallic tiers, and again, it goes down to two lives. They're all PPO, so no HMO is allowed. Um, there are multiple plans you can offer to a group at one time, depending on the size group. So if the group is between 2 to 50, they can pick two plans. If the group is 51 to 100, they can offer five plans to their employees. It does use a different provider network than in California. In California, when we saw the full network PPO with UHC, it, they use the Select Plus. This engineering trust actually uses the Choice Plus, which is actually technically larger in the whole U.S., so it's a, be a better network technically. They also use a three-tier formulary versus what the California groups, which is a four-tier formulary. Underwriting, the main thing we have is that you can sell this engineering trust alongside Kaiser, but UHC needs 50% enrollment, so direct UHC is actually, you know, five enrolled. Here, this engineering trust with UHC, we need 50% alongside Kaiser, and they don't count the Kaiser people towards a 50%. There's a lot of discounts and bundling available through UHC's ACEC trust, so there's ancillary premium discounts, so they'll knock off on their premium in addition to the normal rate bank that they provide, and then if you sell um, dental or vision, you can get a percent off the medical premium. So in California, we can't discount medical anymore, but you can get a 1% off, I'm sorry, it's 2% off the medical premium if with both lines of coverage. If you're selling dental with medical, then you get 1%. And then direct UHC has a great admin uh, discount if you sell multiple lines of coverage with UHC direct. That does not apply to this trust, but again, you can get 2% off the medical premium, which is probably higher. It is important to note that the commissions is 5% for 2 to 100. 
Um, so small group UHC direct is 6.5%. Uh, this is 5%. And then you, the broker, do need to be licensed in Illinois. Um, so you can get a non-resident license, and this slide tells you how you can do that. There's a, an agreement that you do, and you can submit it in. And then we just need to tell UHC that you're in the process of, of getting licensed. For the UHC trust, um, the group does have to be a part of this ACC trust. Most engineering companies already are. If they aren't, that's fine, but they will need to join. And what qualifies them is it does have to be a consultant engineering firm or a land surveying company. Um, the 8711 SIC code is a good guarantee. So once a month here at BNP, we'll run a list of quotes that we've quoted that have that 8711, and your beer and purpose rep will reach out to you and say, hey, remember this trust, do you want us to quote? At that point in time, if you say yes, definitely want to look at it, what we need to get is that confirmation they have one professional engineer on staff at that group. They all, we also need to get the name of the group, of course, and the website so that we can verify that the group itself will qualify for the trust, and the number of full-time employees, not eligibles, but full-time employees. The reason why we have to do that is one, verify it qualifies for the trust, and they will get you a quote for that ACEC trust. The kind of like Trinet, you have to add that membership dues onto the premium, see if it makes sense, but what we've seen lately and definitely picked up even more and more is that you're going to save a lot of premium for the groups that qualify for this, including the membership fees. All right, so with ACEC Engineering Trust, there is, um, we talked about there's a trust membership and there's other membership. Um, we'll just get you the quote so that you know exactly what it is. There's a lot of variables, so just give us information on the previous slide and then we'll get you the quote for that. Sorry, I talked about a lot of this already, so. Um, well, the one thing to know is the first year the group is enrolled is they do give you a discount off the membership dues for the trust itself. Depending on when the group is enrolled, you're going to get a discount. So if they, it goes by fiscal year, but you could get 66% off those member dues the first year. Second year, 33%, and then third year is the year that you're actually paying in full. So you can see if a group joins, say, a November 1st effective date, the discounts apply from November through June. The benefits and value of this ACEC trust is that they do have their own service team, which are very white glove, high service. Um, they have a lot of tools in addition to the normal tools that UHC gives all their members, a lot of wellness, et cetera. And I think that's why the persistency and the the single-digit renewals have been so dominant for so long. As far as enrollment, there is, you know, this is a, an Illinois group, so you're, you're filling out paperwork from Illinois. There are no paper applications, so that's what we'll address um, how BMP specifically can help you with that, make your life easier through online enrollments. And then implementation, UHC has really beefed up their implementation. BMP's turnaround time right now for UHC business is now down at two to three days versus the old seven to eight days it used to be. However, the UHC Engineering Trust still goes through the old version, so do allow about five to seven business days for groups to get approved versus the, the two to three days for groups um, going to U, with UHC Direct through BNP. And the last product I was going to talk about today is the new one. It's 51100 benefit eligibles. So another option to get composite rates for these groups. But what's different on this product versus Trinet and the UHC ACEC Trust is that you do have to be a legitimate 100 plus group, meaning you have to have full-time equivalents of 101. However, what qualifies for you for this special product is that you don't have 101 full-time benefit eligible. You have between 51 to 100 benefit eligible. Plan designs are large group plan designs, and you can offer six plans at once to the group. Commission is also 5%, so very competitive. So things to consider is that if you have these groups that are technically large group, but they don't have a lot of benefit eligible, you definitely want to consider this product. Um, you have to have at least 51 benefit eligible. I know there are a lot of groups that are over 101 full-time equivalents that may only have 20 benefit eligible. That does not qualify for this new product with HealthNet. And unfortunately, they're not offering this product at all if Kaiser is being offered within the group itself. So the benefit of this pool is that you do get composite rates. 
and you can offer those six plans. You get a dedicated large group team, just like all your other Help Met large group clients. And there's a broker bonus going on right now. So the groups that qualify, you see you're going to get either $50 per HMO member or $75 per PPO member. For quoting, it is a large group product, so we need a normal large group RFP. Um, there is a document that's brand new. It's an attestation that the group has over 101 full-time equivalents, but between 51 to 100 benefit eligibles. And then as far as the enrollment, it's your normal large group enrollment, the master app and the employee apps, but we can help you with online enrollment. We're getting lots of questions on how these historical large groups are being transitioned to small group at renewal. And one thing to remember is that, yes, a lot of groups are coming up for a renewal December 2016, primarily with CalChoice and HealthNet. However, Aetna, Anthem, and UHC actually extended these traditional large groups to January of 2017. So they were giving 13-month rate guarantees last year. Sorry, guys. Oh, a little fast. Uh, one thing to also consider when you're moving these or renewing these traditional large groups to small group is that all of our carriers will allow you to change your anniversary month. So if the group was with Health Not Large Group and they're coming up in December, there's a lot of us in the marketplace right now about changing the anniversary date to January, which is allowed. If you don't do that, do remember um, that you know, you're kind of off cycle with those deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums with the new carrier. But if you change the anniversary date specifically to January, um, again, our carriers will allow that. Some of them have time restrictions on when you need to notify them. And you just need to remember that the group will get the new benefits and rates at the time they move. So a lot of groups right now are coming up for renewal in December. You will take the renewal with that existing carrier for one month and then move to the new carrier effective January 2017 so that everything's lined up but you will get new rates and benefits one month after that December renewal. This is a lot of information. I'll just summarize it for you. This is really showing how the large group carriers are handling these 51 to 100 life groups that are now in small group. Aetna and Anthem are similar. Four to six months, essentially, before the group's renewal, they were mailing those attestation forms, just asking the group, how large are you? Doesn't matter, but how they responded is going to dictate the renewal they get, whether it's a large group or a small group renewal. With California Choice, be aware, there weren't many of them, but if you had a group with California Choice that had over 100 enrolled, those groups are getting non-renewed in 2016. CalChoice now only goes up to 1 to 100. They no longer go up to 199. HealthNet, they are sending out an affidavit form as well, just like Aetna and Anthem, but the difference with HealthNet is when you send that back, you're supposed to send back the employer app and a D9C. Aetna and Anthem don't need a D9C when you send that attestation back. UHC is a little different. They have the attestation form, but they're not automatically sending it out to every group. If you know the group is over 100, you can fill that out, give it to the renewal rep, and they'll make sure you get a large group renewal. Um, so that's the basic gist of the slide. Now remember, we don't need new paperwork. It's not like the old days when you're moving, say, from large group anthem to small group anthem, where it was a brand new submission. All of our carriers, it's a, an automatic migration, except for CalChoice. If they want to move from large group CalChoice to small group, they do have to submit a brand new group. Another item on CalChoice is any group that has less than 100 enrolled with CalChoice that was originally written on the large group platform will receive a small group uh, quote. They may or may not qualify for that quote, though, so keep that in the back of your head for those scenarios. Uh, the group has to have 1 to 100 full-time equivalents in order to small qualify for that quote that CalChoice sent out. So if the group is going to take the migrated plans, they don't really need to submit anything with any of our carriers other than uh, CalChoice, assuming they filled out the attestation form. This is a quick reminder on the commission. So most of our carriers have two different levels of commissions. Aetna and Anthem are the same. All the way up to 100, it's a flat 5%. It does downgrade every year to a minimum. Um, then you, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a flat five. It doesn't downgrade anymore, but they do have a cap up to a million dollars annualized premium. CalChoice has two buckets, similar to Kaiser and similar to UHC, depending on the size group at enrollment. 
depends on the commission you'll get. Health fund is a flat five, but they don't have that downgrade up to certain annualized premium, which is nice. And Shield is now a flat five, just like Aetna and Anthem and Health Fund. So what we can do to help you is we can help collect that census for you for these groups that never had dates of birth for all their enrolled members. We have a tool that can help you quickly gather that for those groups. Um, what we highly recommend is that for these groups kind of in the window of large or small, that you run a small group community rates because as we've addressed, sometimes these community rates are actually better than the large group composite. So you don't want to discount that option before you need to. And we have all the December rates available now. Everyone's chomping at the bit for January rates because a lot of people are considering changing their anniversary date. We should have those all by November 1st. I think we're going to start being able to quote some of them earlier in October. Then you want to evaluate those rates. You know, what are the ACA rates? What are the composite rates? And see which way you want to go, especially with Trinet, the ACEC Trust, or this new Health Net product. You don't have to do it, but we highly recommend online enrollment. Beer and Purvis will pay for it. It's free. We'll do all the work. We'll set it up let you know the employees of that group will receive an email, they go in, they verify the demographics of their, their family, they see the plan options, the contributions, they make their plan design selection, uh, sign the app, and they're done. And the employee thinks they enrolled everything online. And then Beer and Purvis will take that behind the scenes and depending on the carrier, convert it to whatever um, version the carrier requires us to submit it. Sometimes it's a census, sometimes it's data entry into their system direct, and a few of our carriers still require paper apps, but we pull those from the online enrollment that the group submitted through BP Enroll. So BP Census is the tool that we have that will help you for these 51 plus groups that were on large group to collect all those dates of birth for those family members in a quick way. Um, the employee receives an email, they provide the simple data, demographics of their group, it's not as involved as online enrollment, we just need to know who in their family, their dates of birth, etc. That gets compiled into a census that we can use on our quote engine, and then we're ready to go. BP Enroll, um, what I alluded to is that we provide the free online enrollment. Uh, we pay for it, we'll do all the work, we set it up, we'll do it for any new group submission. And it applies to all of our carriers. If you sell alongside Kaiser, uh, we can do that as well. And it only takes us a day or two, even in the fourth quarter, to get all the work up and running for you once you provide all the data. So that's everything I wanted to cover today. I'll stop and see if anyone has any questions. Stacy. In the meantime, I just want to say thank you very much for everyone's time. We'll send this presentation out and uh, just let us know how we can help you in the fourth quarter. So we, um, we're very short on questions, so I will remind everyone, if you do have any, please submit them in writing. Um, in regard to Trinet, do you know if they allow split commissions, so between two brokers? You know, I don't know. Um, Stacy. do you know? That's, we can certainly check because they only have one broker on the account. You can't take a B of R over it, but if we submit it and there's two brokers, I would assume that would be okay, but I, I would need to verify. Yeah, I'm, I'm uncertain as well. Okay, and then would you mind just um, touching again on the, as far as submitting paperwork prior, you know, or, or as early as possible and, you know, prior to the December 1st effective date, how early are the carriers going to be taking enrollment paperwork? All of our carriers have said we can submit December 1st submissions right now. So as of 9-1, we can submit 12-1 renewals and new submissions. Some of the carriers are making allowances for the premium checks. So um, UHC has said that they will delay depositing that check. I believe it's officially being announced here soon, but they've told me two weeks prior to the effective date is when they'll hold the checks and then deposit them around November 15th, even if you submit and get the group approved, say, September 15th. Then we have Anthem is stating they'll hold all the checks until November 21st. Aetna claim, uh, states that they will submit the premiums checks on December 1st on the effective date. But again, we can get everything approved, members loaded in the system, it's just the, the check itself isn't being processed. 
and I believe it is HealthNet's the only one that is stating they're going to deposit the check one at the time of approval. So if you submit it in 10-1 for 12-1, they're going to deposit the check on 10-1 when we get the group approved on October 1st for the December 1. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and for right now, um, there, there are a couple of additional questions. I think that they, you know, are kind of case specific. So we'll ask that the reps follow up, you know, with you. And in the meantime, I believe that, yep, th those are the questions that we have, Jennifer. And as Jennifer mentioned, we will provide a follow-up email tomorrow that will include a copy of the presentation as well as a link to the recording. Thank you very much for your time, everybody, and let us know how we can help you at the fourth quarter. We appreciate your business and your partnership.